Alex, Alex. Rhoda Tisa Farrell. Baloney, Scrub, Kristen, Parker.
So we can help with the waiting room. Okay, thank you uh, very much. And on behalf of myself and our council and the Mohawk Council of Akwesasne, we extend our deepest uh, congratulatory remarks to all of you on today's uh, swearing in. So that will now conclude the, uh, the swearing in of our justices. So we will take about a 10 minute break and then we're gonna go into the general meeting. So there we will, there is a reception, uh, the welcome reception will be held at the back. Uh, but so between now and 10 minutes, We'll, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll take some time, take some pictures, and then we'll begin the meeting in 10 minutes. So thank you. To get film blood and not on the
they got to take their own chairs out there?
Thank you. There's no one. All right, uh, good evening to everyone. We're gonna get started uh, this evening here at our general meeting. My apologies to those online for the few minute delay. We had our swearing in of the justices this morning, or sorry, this afternoon. Um, so I'm gonna call the meeting to order. We have the acceptance of the agenda, rules of order, the follow-up from the March 24th general meeting action items. We, have, we had the presentation of the justices uh, already, so we will remove that. But this evening we have a presentation on the MCA operating budget. We have a resolution and announcement. So this evening we're using uh, the hybrid model for the Zoom platform. So I do have a microphone here that people who are going to be speaking in the room need to use the microphone so that those people who are uh, using the Zoom can, can hear the questions. So if I could have a mover to accept the agenda as presented, moved by Vanessa, seconded by Julie, all in favor? All right, it's carried, thank you. So this evening, as mentioned, uh, we are using a hybrid model here. We're here at the, the Ganadigo uh, District um, Recreation Center. We have a number of people online as well. This is our second hybrid model, our hybrid uh, meeting that we've had using Zoom and being in person. Um, so we, we ask for your patience as we continue to adjust how we run the meetings to ensure that those of you who are online can hear us and those of us that are in the room along with the community can hear you as well. And I don't have my rules of order, but uh, I've been reading this quite a bit for the last few years. So this evening's meeting will start, uh, generally starts at 6 p.m. It is 6.25 now due to the presentation that we, we had done for the justices. Uh, we'll go to about 8 p.m. this evening, depending on how uh, time goes and how um, the questions are. Uh, at that time, we'll take a, uh, a check on the timing. The, uh, this is a public forum, so the personal issues will not be dealt with in this forum. Even though we are online and in person, we ask that people don't address other people that are not in this room by name, uh, predominantly uh, individuals um, of the MCA, because they're not here to respond to that. So we use general terms. Um, individual issues or personal issues will be dealt with on a one-to-one -one basis, will not be dealt with uh, in this forum. We will make a, a time to uh, address those issues either this evening or at a meeting set up. We ask that your questions please remain relevant to the conversation that we're having. So this evening is, um, we are presenting the uh, budget. Uh, we ask that the questions remain on topic as we move through. If there are other items, we can discuss that uh, later on in the agenda. As well, I know that we have a number of people online this evening. So if you could use the raise hand function or unmute and indicate that you'd like to ask a question, please do that. I will make a list of people uh, who will have speaking order. Those of you that are in the room as well, please raise your hand. I'll make a list of, uh, of speakers and I'll, I'll, I'll call on you when it's your time to ask a question or make statements. There, if there are any issues that we cannot answer this evening at the general meeting, what we will do is we will take a list of action items uh, back to uh, for next month's uh, general meeting and we'll report them back. So what we have is the action items this evening from March 24th, we report that back to the community. If there's any action items tonight, we will we'll record them and report back uh, next month. So. That is the rules. This evening's meeting, again, is hybrid. We are recording this, so this will be streamed uh, on our MCA uh, social media, on our, um, on our YouTube page at a, at, uh, at a later date. So uh, if those of you that are not, or sorry, those community members that are not able to join us this evening uh, will be able to watch uh, later on. So, so that is our rules of order uh, for this evening's uh, general meeting. Again, this is our second hybrid meeting. I ask for patience from people in the community as well as people online as we move through uh, ask, asking your questions. Again, those who are in the room have to use a microphone so that those online can hear um, and members of council as well, if you could speak uh, clearly, 
if you're close to the microphone, there's a microphone at the end of the table here, uh, but speak into the uh, the portable one as it as it goes along. So, so that's our uh, rules of order again for our, um, our our meeting this evening. We do have uh, I skipped over the attendance uh, for this evening, so we do have two members of our council who are not joining us uh, this evening uh, due to a passing in their family, so they are away on bereavement. And uh, normally when uh, we do have uh, general meetings, um, we had invoked a cancellation protocol whereby if a member had passed in the district, we would move the uh, general meeting. Um, and in this case, there has not been in this district in, in Ganadago, but I do want to, as we have always acknowledged, uh, those families are, who are grieving uh, due to loss. We wanna pay tribute to them and I'll ask now for a moment of silence uh, in recognition of them. All right, thank you very much. So on behalf of myself and the Mohawk Council and our council, we express our deepest condolences to all those families affected by grief over the last month. All right, so as I mentioned earlier, we do have the justice swearing in was on the agenda. We did have that ceremony before the, the, the meeting. That way, uh, family and friends that were here for that specifically were able to join in. We did broad broadcast that and record that to our Facebook, uh, sorry, to our um, our Zoom, uh, and will that will be part of the presentation uh, when it is uploaded. So, all right, so this evening, we're gonna go into our presentation. We have a number of folks on uh, the Zoom system who are part of the, uh, the MCA administration. We have the executive director here uh, joining us as well. Uh, we're going to walk through the uh, budget presentation for uh, the MCA. So I'll turn it over to, to Anne. Thank you very much. So Anne Seymour is our executive director here at the Ma Council. She will walk us through the uh, the budget. We do have the screen share on, so that is being projected there. For those of you that are here in person, we do have paper copies for your review. Following tonight's um, presentation, we will make this material available as well online on the akusasne.ca uh, uh, website. So we'll turn it over to you, Anne. Hello, Seiko, Franchi, community members, everyone on Zoom, our fellow teammates, and community members present here. Um, I am Anne Seymour. I am the executive director. I've been here in the Zoom team for my 14th. I'm happy to follow my doing my job. How do I like it? Um, I love my job here with this team. The first time I'm here on um, this. And um, second, I want to acknowledge the justice of the peace and be right for them. I know that four of us are outside. Celebrating what is great that we have them and it's really a testament to the commitment that our people are already in our own people to the things that we do in our own communities. And I think it's just great to our to actually go to I think that, uh, and perhaps because uh, we have a majority audience online, if you could just come this way and speak because of the microphone here. I know that it'd be ideal to be in front of the presentation, but um, because we have a lot of people online and those who also will be, yeah, will be, uh, you don't have to speak into it, but just Hello. <laughs> <laughs> if you could be close to this microphone, it would be, uh, be appreciated. All right, perfect. So first of all, we're now, I, I welcome you to Mohawk Councils of Akasasne 2022-23 operating budget. And um, yeah, so before I begin, basically an overview of the agenda for tonight in regards to the budget is I'll present the budget. And on top of that, we have some of our teammates on Zoom. I've kindly asked that um, if they don't need to be here, that they stay at home in the sense that um, it's important that we're not um, too close together in far, as far as crowds for the safety of um, COVID. So that's why you don't see a lot of our directors and teammates here. So I want to acknowledge that um, our team, as far as directors, have done an incredible job in regards to the budget that you will hear this evening. Each director will come up with a slide, they will introduce themselves, and then they will introduce the budget and plus um, describe what their budget uh, operating plan is. So the vision for Mohawk Council of Akasasi for this budget is which basically is our future and our responsibility. Next, the mission is uh, with a good mind is our responsibility to protect and exercise our inherent rights while creating sustainable partnerships and building a strong community for future generations. Number four is our strategic goals. 
Here we have uh, our goal of outlining in regards to becoming a self-sufficient um, nation. We want to live in a safe community. We want to monitor and protect our environment. We want to have better management of our lands. We want to improve the community infrastructure, create more jobs and business opportunities, take care of the vulnerable members in our community. We want to increase the fluency in our Mohawk language, take pride in our history and culture, increase access to sufficient and affordable housing. We want to expand our educational services, improve our health and well being, and support our community's recreational needs. These are our 2021 strategic goals. For the MCA budget summary, we're looking at the organizational structure. Basically, we're looking at the community as um, individuals, including members that we're accountable to. Then we have Grand Chief and Chief and Council, which we have here this evening. And we have the executive services, which includes myself, the assistant executive director, Donna Rampoint, Chelsea, Chelsea and her team. And um, then we move on to our eight department departmental programs that you'll hear from tonight in regards to the budget. The eight departments include AMBID, which is the Okasasi Mohawk Board of Education. We have the Okasasi Mohawk Police, the community um, Department of Community and Social Services, the Health Department, the um, Finance and Administration Department, Justice, Infrastructure, Housing and Environment, and finally the Economic Development Program. They will all be presenting their operating budget this evening. I'm now going to move on to the operating budget and I'm going to turn it over to my teammate, Heather Phillips, and she will present the next two slides. All right. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Heather Phillips. I'm the exec. Um, sorry. Whoa, that was a Freudian slip. I'm the director of finance and administration. This is this year's operating budget. Now, a few things you have to know about this year's operating budget is it was done at a. It was done. It was started in December and approved. Um, completed in February and approved in March. So a lot of um, deferrals that we had um, defer, deferral money and monies unspent were not brought into this picture, this financial picture right now. So if you see maybe a deficit in, for example, Board of Ed, that may not exist because of deferral money coming over from last year. So we do have a number of deferrals. We just didn't have an exact number at the time this budget was approved. So carrying on, for Mohawk, um, for government um, council only, they have a budget of 1.1 million, of operating expenses of 1.7. Executive services, an anticipated funding of 11 million, operating expenses of 4 million, special projects of 3.4 million for surplus of 4 million. Economic development, a $15 million project. Most of that is fiber to the home. Um, operating expenses of 15.4 for a, a, a deficit of about 78,000. Department of Infrastructure and Housing, a $12 million budget, 12.8, with operating expenses of about 14.9 uh, for a deficit of about 2.1 million. Community services, 14.9 million with the operating expenses of 11 million, special projects of 3.4 million with a surplus of about 169,000. Department of Health, 33 million with operating expenses of 22.3 million and projects of 12.3 million. With a surplus, I mean a deficit of 1.5 million. Department of Finance and Administration, a $5.7 million budget of, with operating expenses of approximately 5.6 million for a surplus of 145,000. Akwazasana Mohawk Board of Education, 29.5 million operating expenses of 23. 2 million with projects of 6.8 million for an approximate deficit of 495,000. Department of Justice, $2.2 .2 million budget um, funding, expenses of about 2.8 million with an anticipated deficit of 528,000. Public safety, $10 million anticipated funding, $11 million anticipated expenses, and a million dollar anticipated budget. So total anticipated for the um, upcoming fiscal year is 137 million 
um, of funding, 112 billion of expenses, 26 million in uh, special projects with a surplus over deficit of 1.9 million. Um, we did have a late, um, the COLA adjustment for staff was not in integrated into the overall budget. So that was added to take into consideration. So the final budget was for $2.2 million deficit and our past accumulated operating surplus was $2 million. So allocation from reserves for this fiscal year would have come to 167,000. Next slide, please. So this is the OLG gaming budget, also known as the Casino Rama funds. So over the past years prior to, um, prior to the pandemic, we normally um, received $4.2 million every year. Now with the pandemic, that allocation went down to 2.6 million for the last two years. So this budget is council's, for lack of a better term, Casino Rama bud um, budget. So this has been pretty um, static for the last few years. It's been the same budget. They haven't changed anything true drastically. So what they use for with um, what they fund with the Casino Rama OLG money is Ambi Transportation. Council invests in buying two new buses every year to ensure that our our school bus fleet is cut, kept up to date and safe. They use some of the OLG money for the Seaway claim. Um, the claim right now is in abeyance. This money is put aside just in case any costs may arise. Communication unit, very key to council's operations. Um, we do help um, that op um, the salaries and costs of that unit by doing an allocation of 95,000. The Aquazesna Community Fund, that's a call out done every year to fund different programming within the community. We have not done the call out in the last two years. They're, they're rebooting it right now to ensure that's done this year. Um, then executive services donations. If somebody in the community, if a community member needs a little hand up, they, they can go and apply for a donation within executive services. The only criteria is you need to be in good standing. Um, executive services also does funeral donations of $1,000 for, for, for anybody who has lost, had a lost one within the community. So the next set are things that council does every year, 40,000 to each recreation center. They do an allocation to the carnival of 5,000, to the museum of 5,000, to the homemakers of 50, for 15,000, tri-district elders 15,000, then an allocation to the powwow for 5,000. Internal operations, housing, they do help housing with some rental subsidies of 150,000. And they also fund an elders emergency repair program. That repair program allows an elder within the community to get $5,000, get a $5,000 allocation to assist with an emergency housing repair. Um, for more information on that, call the housing department. Um, council is a part of Iroquois Caucus, and that $10,000 is their contribution to be part of that team. The next one is a discretionary allocation for $278,000. This is funds put aside for something that council may wish, some opportunity that may come up and council wants to use money to fund. This money is put aside for them to do so. So, um, for example, um, if the skate park came up or if something they wanted to fund for elders came up, they could use these monies for as their discretionary allocation. Um, opportunity funds matching dollars, 250,000. Sometimes we have um, exciting projects that come up, but the funders wanna see that we're putting some money into the, into the project. So they'll ask, uh, um, ask the council to do 25% contribution and that we, we contribute 25, they do 75, and it just allows us to, to enter into different exciting projects. Community, community heating fuel subsidy, 468,000. Um, that usually costs us about, probably about 800,000 a year. The remain, remainder of the money, we do um, yearly applications to the Aquazesna Trust. So that's our contribution to the uh, fuel fuel allowance. Um, we have paid for church insurance for years and years, and this is where we take the money to do that from. Youth and Elders Culture Language Council does have a youth, youth committee. This is um, money set aside for youth activities and their honorariums. 
Mohawk government staff is not funded from any DISC, DISC programming. So this is um, just a $150,000 allocation to assist with the um, offsetting the cost of their staff. Mohawk language, um, we did have a Mohawk language program in the past for, with the area management board, you know, with um, economic, yeah, ADA, um, but those services were discontinued. So we put this money aside to try and find um, course offerings for Mohawk language. Um, this year, both um, the Mohawk, um, the AMBI and Economic Development Thompson Island are gonna partner to offer some program, uh, Mohawk language programming to staff. And then we put $105,000 towards summer students with, in conjunction with access. And then we do an allocation of 85,000 to Thompson Island for a subtotal of $2.77 million. So this year there was um, a, a slight uh, deficit in the OLG for 179,000. That will be taken from OLG reserves. Um, next slide, please. Next slide, please. So these are the reserves as of March 31st, 2021. Ember, we there is funding from Enbridge for the um, natural gas pipeline crossing through the island. That is $2.5 million. There's um, replacement capital replacement reserves for DTS of 2.2 million. There's ISC admin reserves of 13 million. There's different pockets of health reserve, including non-insured for 5.7 million. There's AMBI reserves from the 10-year grant of 8 million, Department of Community and Social Services reserves, which includes um, welfare of 4.8 million, housing reserves of 3.2 million, and RAMA reserves of 33 million for a total reserve budget of $74 million. Um, I have to say from past experience in my time with Mohawk Council, this is the one, one of the most, how would you say it? Um, most financially healthy I've ever seen the organization. Next slide, please. Okay. This one is Chelsea Francis. So what you see on the screen right now is the Mohawk Council budget for 2022-2023. So listed here, we have the council operations, key salary, and benefit piece of projects of $1.1 million. Uh, expenses, sorry, can you see the screen? Um, but basically what I want to go over is the council expenses. So each individual is listed with the budget. So this budget includes their travel both US and Canada, as well as um, other information expenses that they incur as council members. So you'll notice that each of them do include a slightly different budget. This is based on past, uh, past experience and history, as well as based on which department uh, portfolio they hold. So each one does indicate a little bit of slightly different number, but all of them are based specifically on history and um, their uh, portfolios that they hold. So overall, our total is funding, we received 1.1 million, our expenses are 1.7 million, and as well as other expenses, our deficit is 598,000. Here we're looking at executive services and under the executive next slide please. under executive services we're looking at um, myself and the team of Omaha government support we have arrow we have the employment program the summer, sorry not the summer program we're looking at um, the employee advocate program nation building we have OES the office of the vital statistics we have support and then we have the assessment now under the Here under the service areas is, is um, essentially we're looking at um, and and come stand here and then talk that one. There we go. Better. Thank you. I want to grab that and sing. 
<laughs> Under executive services, we're looking at ISK and RBM, and then we have a departmental review um, with the health departments, and we have um, the financial administration law implementation, which is ongoing in regards to looking at some um, reviews. We have performance measures, the organizational change, which is an ongoing living uh, process. We have new council orientation. We have the update of the strategic plan, which is ongoing and the living documents. We have the ethics app implementation and the contract review for professional service contracts. Under the employment programs, we're looking at the employee advocate. We look at um, summer programs and looking at um, internships as well. Then we move into the Aboriginal Rights and Research Office for Arrow. Here we're looking at the Aboriginal and Treaty Rights. We have the land claims along with the North Shore, the Seaway, the Dundee, the US claim, Barnhart, Baxter Islands, and the Nutville claim. We also have the additions to the reserves, Block 1 lands on Gowanoge, Karen Island, and OPG, plus the four islands of um, Sheik, Presque, Adams, and Toussaint. And then we have educational projects, uh, such as the cultural awareness training with um, CBSA and technical support for nation building, working, the working tables and Indian Day School applications, which are ongoing. For the Mohawk government support, it's basically looking at ongoing operations. And for nation building, we're looking at negotiations with Canada and Canada on the Anatawate self-government agreement. Here we're looking at um, working tables with governance land, fiscal, legal, technical reviews, communications, and pre-implementation. We're also looking at capital projects, such as the Justice Study, ATEC, uh, the Regulation Update, OBS Program Review has been completed. Then we move on to OBS, the Office of the Vital Statistics. Here we're looking at lands and estates, membership, leases, technical support to the ATR working groups, nation building working groups and other committees. Next slide, please. Here's the overall budget for the executive services. The overall total funding is 11.6 million and we have expenses at $4 million. And then the projects totaling uh, 3.5 for a surplus of dollars so as far as the funding, we're looking at employment programs. The funding is $450,000 and the expenses are $450,000. Then we move into the executive services with the Hydro, Hydro Quebec administration. We have funding of 8,675,000 and the expenses are 1,152,000 with the projects totaling 2.9 million. And the surplus here is $4.5 million. Then we move on to the Mohawk Government Administration. We have $485,000. And then we have the expenses at $894,000. And the projects at $205,000 with a deficit of $614,000. We move into the Aboriginal Rights Research Office and we look at $310,000 for funding. And for the expenses, we have $189,000 with a surplus of 121,000. Then we move into the nation building at 1 million and the expenses at 553,000 with projects totaling 327,000 for a surplus of 187,000. Office of Vital, Vital Statistics, we have a funding allotment of $321,000 and then we have the expenses at 512 with a deficit of 191,000. So for the total, again, for funding, it's 11 million. The expenses are at 4 million. The project's totaling 3.4 million and the overall surplus of $4,094,000. Well, just to uh, stop there for a sec, there is a question in the chat here and it asks uh, when you were going through the budget um, service areas and the budget highlights, there's a uh, question about the DISC grant at the project. What is, can you elaborate on that? Or can yes, somebody perfect. elaborate on that? Yeah, so right now what we're going to do is hold off on the questions until we're done the budget and then we'll take questions at the end for about 20 minutes. Otherwise, we're going to slow up the process. Sorry about that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, so we'll note the questions uh, in the chat and we'll come back to them. We do have uh, some answers in there as well. So, okay, you were handing it off to Department of Community and Social Joseph. Services. Joseph, I think you're online. We'll go to you. Thank <laughs> you. 
Hello. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Joey Marin Lozon. I am the new director of community and social services. Um, next slide. So within my administration department, I have uh, myself and my executive assistant. Uh, we are a large department of over 80 employees within Mohawk Council, uh, and we are continuing to grow each fiscal year. Uh, currently, three programs exist under DCSS administration. These programs are Aquasasne Child and Family Services, which represents roughly 70% of the department. Uh, we have the Community Support Program, as well as Aquasasne Family Wellness Program, and the pilot project of uh, the uh, Food Security Program. Next slide. So the following slide represents uh, the budget highlights within each DCSS program. Within DCSS administration, we'll be focusing on creating more partnerships within and outside of MCA to better understand, uh, support the community, creating a new position of social service systems navigator to fill gaps within MCA, uh, redevelop the DCSS organizational chart to implement positions which are needed to better support the community within all departments, um, review of each department's policy and procedures, or programs, policies, and procedures to determine if they best serve the community. Um, so Aquasasne Child and Family Services uh, takes on many important initiatives within the community, and this represents the largest priorities of ACFS this fiscal year. We will be redeveloping our core policies and procedures, and we'll be working with consultant to ensure they serve our community better. Our case management system has been determined as obsolete. We have evaluated new databases and we'll be purchasing a new database that accommodates both Quebec and Ontario prevention and protection files. We have dispersed further surplus dollars from ACFS fiscal year 2021-2022 across MCA departments and uh, related special projects. We will be looking to for further projects to disperse surplus dollars incurred in the fiscal year 21-22, continuing and continuing our partnership with Aquasasne Boys and Girls Club to provide summer and after school programs. <clears throat> Community support uh, will be focusing on the funding of construction to build a, a new multi-trades lab at Yohahio in partnership with Access and Yohahio. Uh, they will be assisting in funding the food forest project with Access and economic development. Uh, COVID relief funds have allowed us to temporarily increase support for community members receiving income assistance. We have purchased an extensive amount of food gift cards with surplus dollars from fiscal year 2021-2022 to further support community members on income assistance and they'll be dispersed as needed. Family wellness uh, program will be uh, focusing on recruitment and staffing of uh, the program. It, it's a priority as COVID has minimized the staffing team there. Um, extension of the living space in the main shelter building and construction of two new bathrooms, uh, renovation of the kitchen within the shelter to construct a teaching and learning kitchen. And lastly, we'll be uh, repaving the parking lot as well as leasing of new office spaces during the renovation within the shelter. Uh, next slide. So on this slide, we have the fiscal budget for 22-23 for Aquasasne Child and Family Services. As you can see, this budget is complex and extensive due to the territorial division of Ontario and Quebec. Um, we receive funding from both provinces. Uh, under the funding, you will see uh, the, the uh, expected funds coming in to operate this year. Next, under the expenses, you'll see what we're expecting to pay out to offer service to the community. Um, the bottom line with this budget is that we have more funds coming in uh, than we have spent. And as um, Heather had said, um, existing surpluses and deferrals um, haven't been taken into account in this budget. So 
um, there will be a, a surplus within ACFS um, for sure. Um, next slide. So first we have the family wellness program. Um, so everything coming in will be expense um, and uh, it's, it's looking like little to, well, not very much surplus, but definitely no deficit um, within here. And then next we have community support. Um, as you can see under the expenses, you can see the funds coming in versus the funds coming out. And we have $3 million in special projects and a surplus in this program. And then lastly, we have the DCSS administration. Um, this does show a deficit, but it's covered by um, existing funds within ACFS. Um, and as said before, deferrals haven't been considered. Um, the funds shown for the treatment center in here um, listed at $496,044. Uh, um, the treatment center has been closed for um, two years. Uh, however, we do still receive the funding. So at this time, it, it's un, it would be considered unspent, but uh, I am looking um, for uh, new ways to expense these funds within the existing contract uh, with the Ministry of Community and Social Services in Ontario. And um, that is all I have for DCSS, and uh, that's it for me. Thank you, uh, Joseph, uh, for that. We'll go to the Department of Finance Administration. We'll go to Heather Phillips. Hello again. Um, I'm the Director for Department of Finance and Administration. I've been with Mohawk Council forever. Um, next slide, please. This is my organizational structure. So like I said, I'm the director of this department with my co-director, Peter Valaket. Um, we, we oversee the finance program, human resources, which is now headed by Belinda Kustajan, the communications program, which was headed by Shannon Roundpoint, and information services, which is led by uh, Christian Francis. Uh, we're currently on um, looking for a comptroller to head our finance team. Next slide, please. Um, so these are our priorities for the year. Um, we deemed uh, we are deemed central service operations because of payroll, um, HR, and finance functions. We're continuing in conjunction with executive services the implementation of the FAL to be compliant with the ten-year grant. We are looking to do the preparation of the annual report in compliance with the with the FAL requirements. And then we're doing a long haul review of all departmental policies. We need to implement training on all of these, which include HR, finance, and IT. And then we need to reboot our long-term service recognition because we have not had staff long-term service recognition during COVID. With finance, we're gonna continue the implementation of EFT. We're, our, we are pressing hard to meet audit deadlines. We're, we're doing a continued implementation of a paperless office. We're looking at new procurement processes, and then we're doing a fleet policy review. Human resources, education, and training on all HR policies, implementing a talent and recruitment module within our ADP system, transfer of all personnel files to the document cloud, uh, salary review, and development imp implementation of a formal onboarding process. With our communications unit, it's to, we're, we're, we're going to incorporate and improve virtual capabilities, including audio and streaming, probably trying to improve these kinds of offerings. We're going to renew and complete MCA-wide communication improvement initiative to make sure that we're reaching the people we need to reach. This includes the implementation of engagement tools with community consultation to see how they want to be communicated with. Um, we do, we're looking at helping with the land claim and nation building communication strategies and doing a video library and transition to the cloud based file management. With information services, we're doing um, a, a upgrade of all of our domain servers in all three districts. We're transitioning the rest of the organization to adopt Office 365. We're preparing for a new rep network design using our fiber to the home infrastructure 
and we're looking to increase the wireless strength within all of MCA for our new mobile workforce. Um, we're also looking to um, implementation of digital signatures for faster approvals within MCA, and then we want to put all of our archives into digital format. Next slide, please. Compared to other programs, our department's quite simple. I mean, our, our budget's quite simple. Communication receives funding of about 200,000, expenses of about 350. So they do have a small deficit of 83,000. Um, myself, we, I have a, a funding of about 3.1 million. That's mostly from IS, the IST grant, expenses of 215,000 for a surplus of 2.9 million. Uh, finance office, they do a small um, um, funding of 199,000 expenses of 1.6 million for an uh, operating deficit of 1.4 million. Human resource, um, they have no um, funding geared towards them, expenses of about 1.5 million, so they, they, they operate in deficit. Information services, they have funding of about 947, that's through chargebacks within the organization and expenses of 1.9 for a deficit of 982,000. Interest earned, so at the beginning of the fiscal year, um, the IS grant is the grant from Indigenous Services Canada. That's the 10-year grant we um, entered into in 2019-2020 fiscal year. So, so at the beginning of the year, ISC Department of Indigenous Services Canada will give us 64 million. This 1.2 million here, is um, we put those into short-term investments and this 1.2 million here is the interest off of those investments. So for a departmental total of 5.7 million anticipated funding, expenses of 5.6 million with an uh, operating surplus of about $145,000. Next slide, please. All right, thank you uh, very much, Heather, for that. We'll now go to the Accessible Board of Education. So we'll look to uh, Donna Lahash, who's online. Saigon, um, good evening. Uh, my name is Donna Waihawi Lahash. I'm the Director of Education for the Agazasne Mohawk Board, and I have with me as well. Saigon, my name is Norma Sunday. I'm the Associate Director for Post Secondary and Continuing Education. Next slide. So the Agusasne Mohawk Board of Education um, is made up of the Board of Trustees, which are elected uh, two members from each of the districts. So we have six member board, um, the Director of Education, Yohahio Post-Secondary uh, Institute, Student Services, three local schools, our child care centers, and the Ambi Administration team. Next slide, please. The Agustas Mohawk Board of Education is in year four of their five-year plan for the AMBI School Board. Our budgets are all aligned to ensure that we can meet the goals in all of our four priority areas. Our priority areas are Mohawk language and culture, student success, relationship building, and organizational excellence. These were built in consultation with uh, our staff, our parents, uh, families, community members. Okay, and so we, oh, there we go. Okay, so Yohahio being the service area that I'm in charge of, we're, we are looking at continuing to increase online programming options this year. We're working on year three of our three-year certification process when we're getting actually um, uh, getting ready to uh, apply. We're establishing pathways programming, which is the interest courses, the certified courses, everything that's non-post-secondary. We're also increasing physical space options and, look, and looking to purchase portables, and as well as expanding on the trades center. We're also looking at developing the micro-credential program options, and we're deep into that right now. For the post-secondary assistance program, we're continuing to increase student outreach and information sessions digitally. We're providing financial planning sessions for new and continuing students. And again, that's being done digitally as well as um, we, we have been able to do face-to-face -face as well. And uh, our, um, our student success officer is now going into the high schools. 
And lastly, we're hosting mandatory orientation sessions for all students electronically as well as in person. Now, yeah, Norma, our student services area, which is um, our superintendent of student services, Denise Jackson, is working on developing intervention programs to address student needs, increasing therapy services such as occupational therapy, speech therapy, and additional counseling services. We're aligning in our intervention services so that the academic and social needs can be met. We're implementing assessment of learning practices. Our Head Start programming, which is our K-3 program in the schools, we're strengthening our partnerships with the zero to six and the child care program to support the social and developmental learning so that we can better bridge transitions. We're training uh, staff on outdoor uh, based learning and learning through play, including more knowledge keepers in the classroom to enrich language and culture. For our food and after school services, we're continuing to develop partnerships with other departments so that we can offset some of the cost of food as this is an unfunded program. We're expanding our after school programming by having partnerships with the Boys and Girls Club so that now we can have also an early years after school program that is hosted by AMBI. Just Nina School um, and AMS, we're increasing the outdoor cultural learning opportunities. So we're in the process of uh, constructing outdoor classrooms. We're focusing on student growth and intervention supports to close gaps brought on by COVID-19. We're expanding our literacy and numeracy programming so that we can support all learning needs. We're continuing to increase technology and virtual learning opportunities throughout. Next slide, please. At Ganadago School, we're continuing to work on increasing Mohawk fluency levels, securing more Mohawk language teachers, continuing to increase in-class support for the language learning, which is vital to the conversation happening in the rooms, focusing on curriculum and resource development to support teachers and training of staff to promote oral fluency for our students. In our childcare programs, which Lanny Sunday is the manager, we're developing special needs services. We're continuing to enhance Ganyageha programming. We're increasing our zero to six enrollment and outreach establishing a home base for community program and support for that zero to six program. We're continuing to increase self-regulation skills and adding mindfulness into the pedagogy. For our transportation services, which Michelle Ransom is the supervisor, we're updating our driver and monitor and parent handbooks uh, to reflect the current, um, the, the current transportation uh, needs. We're updating digital transportation request forms and reports offering bus driver training opportunities and establishing full-time positions for bus and lunch monitors, which is really important for retention of our employees and in order to uh, ensure that we can um, recruit new employees. Language and culture, we're continuing to expand the digitalization of uh, the iMohawk website. I'm hoping everyone has an opportunity to check that out. If you go on the AMBI webpage, you can see all of the additional uh, books and songs and resources that have been put on the website. Continuing to develop Mohawk picture books internally. We're continuing level five program and resource development. We're de uh, in the process of developing new social studies uh, programming and resources in Ganyageha. We're developing music resources, songs and activities. Staff training is ongoing in targeted areas, and we're also looking at um, cultural workshops and camps to be offered that we were beginning prior to COVID and hoping to offer again uh, as we move forward. AMBI operations, continuing AMBI policy revisions, developing administrative frameworks for each policy, and we're continuing to develop partnerships to enhance learning opportunities. Traveling College, Queen's University, scientists in the schools, Cosmodome, uh, and SUNY Potsdam are just to name a few. We're establishing a superintendent of early learning in order to improve those services for our early year students and to align that programming. Next slide, please. Um. Um, the AMBI uh, funding, uh, 17,668,690. Uh, um, if at the bottom, you'll notice that our Head Start programming uh, doesn't have funding attached because at the time of the budget, the funding wasn't available um, 
yet. However, that funding has been received, so that removes that from a deficit. We receive, um, in our funding, we receive a lot of special project money that AMBI does additional um, proposals for to ensure that we have supports for students, additional access to activities, additional access to language and cultural material that we develop and work on. So our team continuously works on uh, submitting proposals as well as in our childcare program, there's um, both federal and provincial funding opportunities that come forward that um, proposals are written in order to enhance the programming uh, in our childcare. Next slide, please. Yohahio, uh, at Yohahio, um, the cafeteria funding um, is, is through um, revenue that's collected from uh, purchases of the food. So at Yohahio, we're fortunate that the revenue and expenses uh, pretty much match for the most part. Um, we also do a lot of proposals that were not reflected at the time that this budget what was available. So there are additional dollars that have been received uh, from various proposals. Uh, recently, over the last few days, we've just received lots of new award letters. Um, the bottom line is it, it appears here that there's a deficit on the bottom line. However, as I had mentioned earlier, that's not the case uh, because we have a lot of funding that's coming in and we have we do have reserve fundings that were presented at the beginning. Um, this year, our real priority in the funding is in our schools to ensure that we have enough supports for our students because we know that after two and a half years of navigating through COVID and being in school and online and schools shut down, students need lots of supports coming back in. And AMBI prior to COVID was surpassing the province in literacy outcomes. And it's our goal to get back there again. Uh, and we do know that the province is also navigating the same types of situations with literacy and numeracy outcomes as we've been in discussions with them as well. Next slide, please. So um, once again, just to summarize at the bottom, uh, our Mohawk language and culture, um, the, the expenses that are listed there, again, there's a lot of proposals that go in to in order to offset some of those costs and it's right in our blocked funding agreement. Uh, our transportation services uh, is an area that um, AMBI is constantly um, looking for support as well because the transportation uh, funding that is provided does not take into account uh, the numerous uh, bus routes that our, our buses have to provide for um, and that we continuously expand uh, because we have more and more students that are living in different areas that are uh, coming to our schools and wanting to access. So we have to keep expanding our routes. Um, so AMBI is in a healthy place with their budget. And if, if we do not receive funding in a particular area, then what the expenses won't be there. So it balances out in the end. Thank you, Thank you uh, Donna. All right, we'll go on to our next uh, department. This is the Oxesma Police Service under the South Department of Public Safety. We'll go to Chief of Police. Sean yes, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name, I, I was just uh, introduced by the Grand Chief. Yes, my name is Sean Zalid. I am the Director of uh, Public Safety, and as well as being Director of Public Safety, it encompasses my role as uh, Chief of Police. Um, next slide, please. Under the slide here, you can see the, um, the programs that I have under the Department of Public Safety. I would just like to point out that the uh, there was a mishap there. This patch should be in, included under AMPS and we should read EOC there. So we have a compliance that works under the Department of Public Safety. We have AMPS. We have the Organized Crime Initiative, which is JIT, our Joint Investigation Team. We have our SAVE team, which is our Marine Unit. We have the EOC, as well as the Aquazas de Mohawk Amulets. Next slide, please. Compliance has now moved from justice to uh, Department of Public Safety, AMPS. Uh, the transition has gone very well. We have been able to hire uh, only one new compliance officer since um, Mike Francis has retired. We are uh, going to be reposting again to try to hire a new officer as well to have a team of two uh, compliance officers. Uh, the Aquazas de Mohawk Police Services, along with the APA, have ratified a new agreement. 
a working agreement that took place in January of this year. The agreement was expired since December 31st, 2019. Therefore, retro payments will be made, need to be made to all permanent officers and dispatch permanent dispatch members. We have hired three new recruits. Uh, they will be headed off to the Ontario Police College uh, sometime in May of this year. Uh, throughout the 2021 year, we uh, lost five of our officers, two of which resigned, and uh, the others transferred out to other police services. We have made investments over the year and will continue making investments throughout this year and the next into marked and unmarked vehicles. Our IT systems, we have security upgrades that need doing. Our uh, video interrogation room also needs upgrades. We have also purchased body, body cameras for our officers, which we uh, commonly see uh, on TV. It's, um, it's something that protects, uh, obviously is for officer safety issue, as well as a safety issue for community members when dealing with officers. We're looking at hiring three more cadets as well uh, when our officers go off to OPC. Uh, I've secured additional funding uh, to increase our manpower and our uh, save unit. Uh, currently, we don't have the capacity to be able to patrol our waters on a 24 seven basis. Uh, we have a bilateral agreement that I'll get into a bit further with uh, the Ontario government, but we did not have one with Quebec and I have managed to uh, secure one with the Ministry of Public Safety. And in regards to our uh, project of uh, having a new uh, police station on Cornwall Island. It's currently under development. Uh, there's still some uh, phases to go through yet. So there's not much more to say about that at this point in time. As far as our joint investigation team goes, uh, there have been no significant changes to the program. Although uh, the focus uh, of, our, uh, of our investigations have been um, I've been leaning more towards uh, guns. As you know, uh, there's been problems in the streets of Toronto, Ottawa, and Montreal with uh, weapons uh, coming into the country. Not saying that they're all coming through our territory, but there has been issues. And we have lately, as you've seen in the uh, newspaper and different articles that have been posted, our, uh, our officers have been intervening, making more and more arrests in regards to uh, weapons being uh, smuggled through our uh, territory. We have also, by the because of this, uh, decided to join the Central Intelligence Service of Ontario and as well have a member that will be uh, seconded to the Provincial Weapons Enforcement Unit, uh, which helps uh, combat um, the uh, smuggling and importation of illegal weapons into our country. As far as our Marine unit goes, we've uh, upgraded equipments and still need to do so. Our boat engines have need to be replaced. Uh, a new pickup was bought because of the, the size of the boats. Uh, to be able to pull them. IT equipment as well for their offices. Uh, we, we will be incre increasing the patrol capacity, as I said, because of our uh, new agreement that uh, should be announced shortly within the next uh, few weeks or month and to permit us to have a 24-7 patrol rotation. And we have to add enhanced security to, to our boathouse as well. I'm sorry, I'm just about to lose my voice here, so I'm going to try to make it quick before I uh, shut myself up. As far as Mohawk Ambulance goes, AMA, uh, they've transitioned from the Department of Health to the Department of the Public Safety. That's gone well. Uh, we have been, we have noticed and we've, it's been reported back to us that the level of service to the community is increasing and we do need more uh, EMTs. So we're working with access in terms of recruitment. Next slide, please. If you look here, we have the breakdown of our, uh, our funding versus our, our expenses and our surpluses and deficits. As for the JIT, you have the amounts of the funding there. Uh, what I could say is that the funding expires in 2023. We are uh, currently uh, at the beginning, uh, initial stages of sitting down with Public Safety Canada to uh, renegotiate uh, an extension and a new agreement for that um, JIT unit. Uh, as far as AMPS goes, uh, AMPS, the Marine unit, sorry, SAVE uh, under AMPS, we have an agreement, a bilateral with the Solicitor General of Ontario that expires in 2026. That agreement uh, procured us yearly 1.75, 1.764 this year for our SAVE unit. 
And when the Ministry of uh, Public Safety of Quebec approached me in regards to uh, our waterways and how we can enhance uh, our, uh, our patrols, I said, there's one way to do it. I mean, it's adding extra bodies out on the boats, but to be able to do that, I need extra funding. So we entered a negotiation early this winter, January, February sometime. And uh, as I said a few minutes ago, uh, the minister should be coming to our community to make the announcement. Uh, I've negotiated a five-year uh, term with them, a deal that will uh, grant us an extra $1.25 million a year to bring our budget up for our save to about $3 million roughly a year. And that'll permit us to hire extra officers to be able to secure our waters. And also they're including uh, a new boat because we will need uh, two boats out on the water and one back up at all times. As far as the uh, police services, our AMPS budget, that's expiring uh, in just a little under a year. It will be expiring March 31st, 2023. Um, I've approached the uh, MSP, which is the Quebec Ministry of Public Safety, as well as Solicitor General to start negotiating as soon as possible. And we're yet to hear from the federal government to see if they would like to start earlier than later to make sure we don't end up uh, in February or March and we still don't have a deal at hand. As far as the three uh, following lines, there are grants we receive uh, throughout uh, the year. Usually we're working on, working on a two-year grant. We have missing American women that allot us uh, the sum of $446,000. We have the victim services grant, and we also have the human trafficking grant. What this permits us to do is have extra investigators work in these particular files out of our unit. As for compliance, we have uh, no funding for compliance and the expenses are of uh, roughly $94,000 for the year. Uh, for the ambulance, we have funding that amounts to 620, but as you can see, the expenses are much higher and that's where it creates a deficit for my budget. And, and as far as emergency measures goes, we have um, funding for $88,000 and our expenses will be roughly 92. So we're looking at a small, roughly $5,000 deficit there. And you have the totals at the bottom of the page. And that's it for the public of, uh, Department of Public Safety. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Sean, for that. The next department is the Department of Health. So we'll go to uh, Amber Montour for that. Hi, everyone. I'm the Director of Health. Um, with me, I have Tessa Jaco, our Assistant Director. Next slide, please. So our department consists of eight programs with over 200 employees. We've been accredited since 2005. We provide quality health care to our community members here in Aquazessing. Next slide. Today we'll be sharing some highlights for this fiscal year. For health administration, our focus is on recruitment and retention of healthcare professionals to maintain accreditation standards and prioritize our workplace wellness, to increase funding to support long-term care needs. For Jordan's principal, we'll increase awareness of our service availability, provide access to speech therapy, educational supports, medical equipment, and mental health services. For community support services, Will increase care for the elderly and identify service gaps in health. For community health, we have ongoing COVID-19 response, which includes our vaccinations, PPE, testing, our mobile testing site, and our core assessment site located here at Ganaguatsalio. The ongoing maintenance of the programming objectives from previous years and share resources to increase services to our community. For holistic health and wellness, we have a new mobile medical clinic, which we'll be rolling out this fiscal year. And we also um, will be implementing cancer screening clinics in each district. We have capital projects for both the Goanoga Medical Clinic and the Healing Lodge. We'll focus on harm reduction and increase access to our addiction services. We have recently um, engaged in a partnership with Concordia University for art therapy, music, and drama. 
We'll continue our medical teaching site with McGill University, Ottawa University, and Queen's University. We have students who rotate throughout the year. Um, and this summer, we hope to also have our cultural competency training at the Thompson Island. For Aquasesti non-insured health benefits, we will focus on policy manual updates, database software upgrades, and increase access to medical transportation. For the Akisata Lodge, we um, continue to maintain compliance with our Ministry of Health guidelines. Um, we will increase connectivity, access to technology and training. Infection prevention and control, medical supplies and additional training for all of our staff and adhere to the standards of care and quality improvement. For home care and home support, we are um, in partnership with the Cornwall Community Hospital and will be posting this summer a position for an Indigenous patient navigator. This will be a dual position between the Department of Health and the hospital with our community in mind. We will also seek palliative care training and increase access to bereavement and grief services for both staff and community. For Jungwon Incident, we um, maintain our compliance with all of our ministry guidelines. We'll focus on education and training on all of our policies, infection prevention and control measures, risk assessment, our reporting processes, and um, with DIG, our roof renovation project. Next slide, please. This is um, our budget for this fiscal year, 22-23. For community health, our team is led by Leslie Bureau, program manager. Services available are maternal child health, diabetes management, and our environmental health officer. We have 3.1 million in funding and 2.3 million in expenses. Our surplus in this area is around $761,000. For DOH administration, I work alongside Tessa Jocko, Andrew Francis, Brandon David, Alicia Thompson, Ryan King, and Tess Benedict. Our focus is on health and safety, clear reporting mechanisms, access to technology, lateral kindness, training, coaching, and education, and land-based healing. We have 3.9 million in funding with 3.7 million in expenses. Our surplus in this area is around $176,000. Our newest program for the department is Jordan's Principal, led by Mavis Williamson. Her areas of service include speech therapy, educational supports, medical equipment, and mental health services. This is included in the line for DOH admin and her expenses include $538,000. For home care and home support, our team is led by April White, a registered nurse and program manager. This is the area where we have the Indigenous Patient Navigator um, and we have $2.8 million in funding, $2.4 million in expenses with a surplus of $353,000. Next, we have the Yakisato. Oh, next slide, please. Next, we have the Yakisato Lodge, which is led by May Lazor. We have 20 long term care beds, eight respite care beds, and one palliative care room. We have $174,000 in funding and $2 million in expenses. This is an area where we have a deficit of $1.8 million. Community support services are led by Tess Benedict, community support service manager. Meals on wheels, home maintenance, respite care, foot care, congregate dining, the tri-district district elders, um, home security checks and disabilities and crisis intervention are all supported in part by this funding. We have $1.2 million with 1.1 million in expenses. We have a surplus of around 64,000. Next slide. Our next area is the non-insured health benefits led by Melanie Gibson, program manager, and Leah Mitchell, assistant program manager. Service areas include dental, 
MSNE, pharmacy, vision, and patient transportation. We have 13.2 million in funding and around the same amount in, in expenses with a surplus of $2. Chungwanusere is led by Barry Lazor, program manager, along with Evelyn Brunet. We have 50 long-term care beds with 3.3 million in funding and 5.1 million in expenses. This is another deficit area of 1.7 million. Next slide. Lastly, we have Holistic Health and Wellness, led by Delia McDonald, a registered nurse and program manager. This area includes primary care, traditional medicine, mental health, addictions, and prevention. There are $4.9 million in funding with 4.1 in expenses. The surplus in this area is 796,000. For overall DOH, the deficit areas are resolved by surpluses within the MCA overall budget. We have $33 million in funding and 34.5 million in expenses, leaving us with an overall deficit of 1.5 million. That's all I have for the Department of Health. Thank you so much for your time and stay safe. Thank you uh, very much, Amber, for that. <clears throat> Our next presenter will be the Department of Justice, who uh, Joyce King is in the room here, so we'll ask her to come forward. Thank you. Welcome, welcome, Canada Freedoms. I'm Joyce King. I'm the director of the Office of the Justice Department, and we have been um, here since about 1980s when they formed the department. Next slide. In here, you will have you will see that we have the Office of the Justice Department itself, and that's the administration part of it. In the administration, of course, there's the director, there's a justice coordinator, and a clerk receptionist. Then we have the Office of the Community Justice Program, which was created as a result of a protocol agreement with the Crown from Quebec, Ontario, and Canada to do diversions and other programming services that relate to criminal code offenses. So then we have been under the Akwesasne Court that actually started in 1965 when we had the first section 107 Justice of Peace here at Akwesasne and then we continued on with um, the services appointing people from Akwesasne. And our new program is the Akwesasne Representative and Advocacy Program, ARAP for short, that started um, probably in 2019, but we're actually able to get the program up and going. And on Monday, we celebrated the grand opening. And then we have a civil remedies that provide us with victim services. If they have any legal issues in Ontario, then we're able to give them some assistance. Next slide, please. Here, you're gonna see community justice and they work with, uh, well, they have um, routine operations. They have the Indigenous court worker that works in Ontario and Quebec on criminal matters. And they advise family, families and victims as well as um, offenders on what their rights are in court and the process. So that's a very good program that's going on. And we try to go to every, um, court that where there would be a indigenous person from a processing. Then we have the MCYS Youth Worker Program that works with um, court ball probation. And they mainly do the same thing if there are criminal code offenses and it's a youth, then they will get the services from, from the youth worker and try to get them to mitigate or get a diversion or whatever else they need. So that is a another program that helps people understand the process as well as what the rights are. We have a Gladue writer and an aftercare worker. Those are two different people. The Gladue writer works on um, doing a social economic um, report for the offender in order to mitigate some of the circumstances or some of the charges or, some, or sometimes even the length of, of um, jail time. So that is a, it, it's a report that is given to the judge and the prosecutor, as well as the defense counsel to help the offender understand some of the things that they have 
gone through, and some of them is trauma from residential school, from not knowing their identity, and from um, um, just not being able to work like drug addictions and other things that happened. Aftercare is working with the family to improve the, the um, person that is coming home and help the family with some of the things that they have to go through. We have the victim support worker who is at the Akwesasne Mohawk Police Service and they provide counseling and different services to victims and they work um, in conjunction with the police. So counseling is, is a very good thing as well as some of the services that are offered to parole protection in Ontario. <laughs> you have the early release parole program that is through Correction Service Canada, where somebody who might be, who is in a federal system, and this means a longer term sentence where they would be able to be released early. If they are released early, then they have to create a plan for the person to come out of jail a little early in order to have a little bit more supervision. Then we have the Native Inmate Liaison Officer. They are at the Ottawa Carlton Detention Center and they provide cultural programming and cultural counseling. And it's very effective. Um, at one time, we made a call out to ask people if they wanted to donate books. Of course, they had to be soft covered, it could be hard covered. And those donations set up a library just for the Indigenous inmates that are at the Ottawa College Detention Center. We have Akwesasne Court. At Akwesasne Court, we're going to start negotiations on the recognition of the court. Right now, it's a small recognition from the outside, and that was with the couple's property law. And now we want to move forward. And you're going to hear it a little bit more under Justice Administration, what that negotiation will be like. The, we also had training for additional justices, and early today you saw them sworn in. Yay, we have four new ones, so now we can expand the court a little bit more. We need to update the court regulations to ensure that we meet both sides of, um, of the court. What do I mean by that? It means that we have to be able to provide the services that our community wants, and our community has advised us, as well as providing the services or the, the structure that is on the outside. So we have to walk in two worlds, not only the world that, you know, the world view of Akwesasne, but we also have to meet the criteria on the outside in order to get that recognition. We have expansion of the Akwesasne court to handle additional, additional civil matters. Right now, um, sometimes there's not an any place for a person to go to get custody of their child or child support, they have to go to Quebec or Ontario, and it's a very complicated matter. We hope to be able to handle that, and it will be through legislation in order for the court to handle matters that are family matters, as well as different dispute resolution in the next one, like contract disputes. So if you have a uh, contract dispute between your neighbor or a contractor, then we would bring them in. But we're not there yet. SCANA orders, of course, are like the peace bond orders under uh, under the criminal code, but we call them SCANA orders. That is the orders that have been put together in the uh, under the Alcazoni court law. Justice administration. We're creating a resource. Oh, just to let you know, and, and it's very important to know that conservation program is with AMPS. So any dog complaints and bylaw infractions, you call AMPS and get a hold of the compliance officer. For the conservation program, you want to, or the conservation officer, you want to get a hold of environment. That would be things like illegal dumping. They're also doing the pet wellness. So please contact them and it's, they're not with justice anymore. One of the things that we created this year was an oversight committee on legislative development because we wanted to bridge the communication a little bit better between council and the community. So we're able to say, you know, look at this oversight committee, 
and develop the terms of reference so that council and community can start talking together. They're representatives of the community as well as representatives of the council. They're just as portfolio holders. But when we go into working task groups to actually develop a piece of legislation for Akwazasne, then we will ensure that the portfolio holders, the chief portfolio holders of that particular subject matter will be able to sit in the working task group. And then we have a very good robust discussion on legislative development as well as getting that robust, robust conversation from the community members on how they want to proceed with the new legislation. The other thing we're developing is um, we, we can work on three priorities, three different laws a year. That's kind of like our, our capacity. And we decided that we needed to look at one piece of new legislation, brand new, has never been written before. And then we're going to look at a law that needs revisions or amendments. And then of course, we're going to look at those laws that are were in the past that might not be relevant anymore. So our three priorities will look at a very brand new piece of legislation, one that needs amendment that's already in Akwazesti, and then those ones that need to be rescinded. And we think that's a good um, process for us and right now, what we're doing is sending a survey out to the community. If you haven't received one, please get a hold of Connie Lazor, who is our justice coordinator, and she will provide you with that survey. You bring it into us or send it into the website, however you want to do it, and we will set the priorities for the year. It will go to council, and we will have a discussion on what the community wants. And we're also looking Beyond that, beyond that, we were able to receive funding to look at Bill C-92. Bill C-92 is about the child welfare law. We want to look at it to say, hey, you know, um, instead of child welfare, let's have child rights and responsibilities. So instead of using that, the term, which isn't very good, we are creating a manual for legislative development so anyone who comes in, we want to ensure there's consistency, continuity, clarity, conciseness, whenever we do a piece of law. So we've developed a template for not only legislative development, we, we have a template for charters, we have a template for procedures. So hopefully this will make us go a little bit faster in order to provide better legislative development within the community. In, um, and just to let you know about compliance and compliance program, we are trying to send all the policies over to the compliance program that we had within justice to ensure that you know um, it's consistent with what was happening before because there are some regulations that you do need to be followed. So we're sharing a website and I'm dumping as much as I can over there. Um, we also need to create a manual for the acquisition court justices and it's a resource guide based on the court regulations, based on policies, there's a mediation policy, based on some of the, um, what does it say? Um, Akwazesne Review Commission. The Review Commission was created and it's, and it's not only through the court law, but they have their own charter. We, in order to meet the outside requirements, we have to have a commission that is an arm's length from council. So their Aquazesne Review Commission is, is created and they're the ones that made the appointment and Mohawk Council confirmed it. And that has been going very well and they developed the judicial and updated judicial code of conduct for the justices. And that was in their, their um, oath of office. And then the other thing we want to provide the justices is the, court, is the case law case law for all the decisions that had happened in the past, there'll be one resource so that they can see what happened during a, a case or a matter so that they can help with the decision to keep that consistency going. Then we have a civil remedies and that provides advocacy to the victim, um, yeah, victims of crime and that is free legal aid to them, and that's in Ontario. 
Right now, we have an, an extension until July. We're hoping to get another year um, later, and that's located in Ontario under Aquasasper Corp. So if you need to use it, please um, call Rosebud Cook. We're looking into negotiations with Canada, Ontario, and Quebec again to recognize the court, and it's to have a single justice agreement. Um, we've made a lot of inroads. Um, they know Aquasasper Court. They know the regulations. They know the laws we're doing, the jurisdiction. And um, they're ready to, to take the second step and look at an agreement. We have partnerships with different universities, mainly McGill and Queens. They provide research. We're getting law interns over the summer, and they're going to help us do some of the projects that we weren't able to do before. Okay, next one. Next slide, please. So, in here, you will have justice. Um, people, you know, Department of Justice Canada doesn't fund um, our program because it's pretty brand new. No one else has a court, a First Nations court. Um, they did provide some funding, sixty thousand, and we're and we run on a deficit most of the time, three hundred and eighty-two thousand. With the Aquasafi Representative and Advocacy Program, that was a result of of a case by Cindy Blackstock into to the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal. And she fought to have fair child protection at First Nations. As a result of that, we submitted a proposal for $1.2 billion and we're spending $1.2 million. We had just had the grand opening again on Monday and we're hoping to make sure that people know that they're there at 55 Water Street in Cornwall. And we're there to not only ensure that we're centered around the children for people who might be living in Cornwall or anywhere else across Canada, but we also provide some services to the families. In community justice, they have different programs and I already talked about the Indigenous Court Worker, the Aftercare, <clears throat> the Indigenous court worker, like I said, and the, and, and on here it's called May, and the Ottawa, the Native Inmate Liaison Officer and Section 84, which is the Early Release Program and Victim Services. And they run, they, they pretty well manage, really good, just running a little deficit. And then we have the court that, well, we were able to get some funding through Justice Canada for the justice training. Under them is the legal aid that's the victim services. There's probation Ontario, probation Quebec, and then the early release program with a deficit of 528 I think that's it, right? Yeah, that's everything. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Joyce, for that. <clears throat> the next department we'll go to is the Department of Infrastructure, Housing, and Environment. So we'll turn to Leslie Tapper. Sago, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, so uh, the Department of Infrastructure, Housing and Environment. Um, my name is Leslie Pappen. I'm the um, acting director of the department, uh, what we normally call DIHE for short. I am uh, here also with uh, Charmaine Caldwell. She's the associate director for our department. Um, Charmaine is also a lead for our housing department. So she will uh, talk more on the housing sector as we go along in our slides. Um, our department is comprised of 92 employees comprised of three sectors, which is the infrastructure to whom everyone knows as DTS. Um, we now have housing and environment program. Um, the department as a whole has been combined in order to effectively and efficiently work together as one unit based on level of our services. Um, our operations and connections within our program. We also provide to the organization and to the community. That being said, um, I would like to briefly talk a little bit more about our various programs. Um, the infrastructure division, um, our, our mission statement that we, uh, we try to hold is uh, the department will, uh, provides professional projects, deliver service to the community of Oxaste in planning, design, construction, and maintenance of all community buildings and infrastructure. 
Um, these services will be delivered according to policies and directives of the organization. Um, oh, sorry, if um, we can move back the slide, sorry. Um, so the, um, the infrastructure division, I'll just go through each of the areas just to provide a brief uh, description. Um, so the um, infrastructure division handles the administrative duties, management of capital projects. This includes project management, procurement planning, and budgeting of projects. We look over MCA capital buildings, the infrastructure assets, and to ensure it's properly managed to plan, maintenance, replacement enhancements, and our repair activities. We are a deficit program, and so we need to seek funds, grants from federal, provincial entities, whether it's ISC, MTO, MTQ, et cetera, to cover and help with our project funds. This applies to new and existing MCA assets, whether it applies to infrastructure, water, wastewater, roads, and buildings. In total, we have 47 MCA community assets. This includes, uh, again, water, wastewater treatment facilities. Um, we have our water plants, schools, daycares, rec centers, clinics, long-term care, elder, elder care facilities, and in buildings, police station, general maintenance, garage, um, health and social services, including family wellness center and, and the shelter. So all MCA buildings and infrastructure need to be maintained and upgraded. Um, our maintenance sector maintains the upkeep of our building assets, the building conditions and equipment operation, and we monitor this with our asset management system. We have three maintenance managers on board. We have Tony Benedict who handles the MB schools daycares for all districts. We have Clayton Benedict who handles the Department of Health DCSS buildings for all districts. We have uh, actually right now we have a vacant position who would um, this person would handle our administration buildings for all the districts. So this position will be posted really soon. Uh, we have our roads program um, with Stanley Jacobs, who is the new roads manager. He is our newest member to our team, and he handles all roads, bridge assets within all districts, among other, other areas dealing with roads. We have our water wastewater program, who service all districts. This is run by our manager, John Adams. Uh, the capital projects in which I handle these projects, these are development, planning, procurement processes, budgeting needs for new facilities and infrastructure. These are large scale projects that involve planning and resources. The housing division is led by our associate director, Charmaine Caldwell, who will be reporting on housing budget in the next few slides. She and her team handle all housing needs requests dealing with this program. And finally, last but not least, our environment program led by environment program manager Avery Francis. Uh, he handles all environmental needs. His team deals with culturally based environmental assessments for businesses, housing and infrastructure conservation, species at risk, contaminants, invasive species control, agricultural ad advisement, uh, mineral and fish habitat assessment and conservation. So, so as you can see, we're a busy department with many various projects on the go. Uh, which leads me to the next slide discussion on budget highlights, reporting on what we have projected to work on for the year. So, thank you. Um, so, for the service area delivery, the Director of Infrastructure, Housing, Environment, DIHG, the budget highlights um, identified and um, what we have allocated for this year. Our focus will be on to provide safe drinking water to all residents within MCA3 districts is a priority. Effectively manage MCA's capital planning process and provide project management services for all capital projects. Improve community services for all infrastructure sectors by meeting standards and applying daily, I can't see the word, okay, create, uh, um, the next item, create avenues of communication to intake community requests for services. Um, next, to continue lobbying strategies for capital investment towards our 20-year uh, capital plan. Under our building maintenance sector, um, focus will be yearly operating costs are rising. There's a note to say that uh, they're rising due to inflation and increased space needs for community service provisions. So we have a, we've, there's an issue, it's an ongoing issue, and uh, our garbage costs are high and uh, need to seek additional funding. So and we also have an environmental waste management program coordinator planned for this year. 
DIH will work to assess and implement the operational review of DTS DIHE service and service agreements. Uh, we have annual repairs, equipment replacements, and retrofits that are ongoing to meet the space needs requirements. Uh, under our road sector, um, focus um, regarding that is we received additional dollars from Quebec for operations. And we need to continue to a renewal and lobbying by council for um, our roads. This is one of our priorities. We like to get these um, underway. Um, we have MTO provides road maintenance subsidy for Ontario roads and grant funds to design. Um, for example, um, we received for the Hamilton Island Bridge, so that's going to move forward. We have uh, island revenue funds supplement road maintenance annual costs. Um, ISC provides funding shortfall for annual road service, such as ditch drainage and street light repairs in all three districts. So we're working with, with them. Um, water and wastewater. We have, uh, we need to seek funds this year for St. Ridge's water plant repairs, uh, rooftop heater, the turbine pumps, valves, stability meters. Um, these are aged equipment that we need to uh, have replaced. Uh, additional costs also for waterline extension requests for community members. We're noticing more and more people are um, requesting for uh, connections to the water line and uh, also emergency repairs to existing water lines. So um, again, that is um, um, upgrades needed for, uh, for the uh, water or wastewater. Capital projects um, that we're looking at this year we have current projects. Um, we have the geognosity roof replacement, magnetic door locks, fire alarm, nurse call station. And we're working with uh, Health Canada as well as ISC on this. So that's going to be moving within, um, I would say, a month or so, trying to get that on the go. And that would be tendered out. We have Wade LaFrance Memorial Road Reconstruction. Phase two is coming on board. That's coming from ISC. So we're just waiting for a letter of approval. Um, we're trying to, we'll be getting that out um, in your near, uh, I would say a month or so, two months, trying to get that underway. Park Street, Hilltop Drive, Super Road Reconstruction. This phase two is coming. Um, as soon as uh, we get the schedule with the contractor, we'll, um, we'll get them to mobilize. I'm, I'm thinking mid-May, early May, hopefully soon. Uh, the fire department, uh, station number three in Sinai, new building. We are putting, we have an application working with ISC as well as consultants. Uh, so we'll get, we need to, we'll get that underway. Um, that's a lengthy process with the um, funding source. AMPS police station, the um, retrofit, um, we have uh, design dollars allocated for that. Uh, we are currently working with the um, the engineering uh, architecture firm, and as well as um, this is a um, procure, uh, a partnership with the property owner for this for this building okay, for Coon Island. So um, that's underway. Uh, hopefully, get that out to tender. We have the Hamilton Island Bridge detailed design. And this is, um, um, we have to get this underway also this year. Um, we just awarded uh, from MOT um, 76,000 to go to proceed with that. So um, that's good news. The LED street light installation, Lucumber Road, south and north um, from MACST and um, no, the amount of 134 that is the community trust um we will continue development of new high school detailed design dollars and contract admin so we will be seeking that and providing an application to uh to ISC. we have a traffic study for the three districts under uh underway so we'll be seeking out a consultant um to provide that and that is a lengthy um there's a lot of work involved with that, and that deals with roads. Um, priority of roads, we have um, bridges to look at in Snide. 
um, we have the stop signs, looking at various locations, the traffic flow, um, the street lights too. So there's a lot involved in that and um, we will keep the community informed as we go along. Okay, next slide. So this one is the uh, for housing. I will um, I'll ask Charmaine to um, just talk more about it, her uh, her program. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, housing administration. We will be continuing on working on our policy updates. Uh, we're, we're we'll also be continuing on working with the housing renovation fund for handicapped community members. And we want to increase the amount for upgrade loans and the amount for new construction loans that we provide um, due to the increased costs of materials and, and uh, equipment that uh, are needed to for construction and repair. Uh, we will continue with the elders fund and emergency repairs with our rental and rent to own. Uh, we've received 2.4 million from CMHC rapid housing initiative. We will be constructing constructing 16 single bedroom units, eight on Point Road on, on Gawanoga and eight on, in Whoville. And we will continue with the maintenance and repair of our existing 170 units. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. Okay, so I will continue along with environment. Uh, the core services for environment, uh, they deal with environmental assessments, mapping, conservation, research and consultation. Next slide, please. Uh, so for the budget focus this year, budget highlights for environment, um, Indigenous Service Canada, they were working with that regarding shaping with the shift to uh, climate change in Aqua Salsa. The, uh, again, with working with Indigenous Service Canada, Ontario Regional Waste Coordinator, and caring about our waste initiative. The Ontario Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks, Area of Concern Support. The Ontario Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks, St. Lawrence River Strategy for a Beautiful and Healthy. Uh, St. Lawrence River, a framework uh, for community action. The Ontario Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks, Advancing Shoreline Restoration in Aquasasana. Resituating data and planning for the future. Ontario Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks, uh, dealing with St. Lawrence Corner Area of Concern, dealing with fish consumption and sampling community input project. Um, the Department of Fishery and Oceans, Indigenous Marine Liaison Officer, uh, building meaningful relationships with Indigenous communities and organizations for the purpose of the Canadian Coast Guard Program and Ocean Protection Plan project. International Joint Commission Development of a Framework for Fish Consumption Advisories, the St. Lawrence River Case Study, Clarkson University, Reason, which is River, uh, River Environment and Sensor Observation Network. The project is Understanding Ecosystem Change on the St. Lawrence River. That's a Ganya del um, to support community strategies for well being. Parks Canada Contribution Agreement, the Ontario Power Generation, Fish in Near Shore Survey, Watersheds Canada, Shoreline Rest Restoration in the St. Lawrence River, that's Cornwall Area of Concern, the Aboriginal Fund for Species at Risk, Aquatic, Understanding Sturgeon to Protect Our Future, the Impact Assessment Agency of Canada, um, this deals with regional assessment of the St. Lawrence River area. Next slide, please. Uh, just Leslie, I know that uh, there's a lot of uh, budget line items here. If you could just do the um, the roll-ups of each of each program. So sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm just actually going to go and just talk about the bold items that we have highlighted for um, our area for our department. So. Um, under infrastructure, the DTS administration facilities, this is maintenance, um, the anticipate funding funding is 955,766 and the expected expen expenses is 826,000. 
The capital projects is roughly 1.5 and the expenses is 1.5. The DTS and min is 86,000. Expenses is 694,000. Um, DTS building maintenance uh, 840,783 thousand expenses. Which is, sir. Okay. Uh, education facilities. We have um, funds for 1.4 and expenses of 1.7 with a deficit of 303,000. Next slide. The garbage and fire protection, the funding we have is 1.1 and expensive is 1.1. The environment division, we have um, funding for 85,000 expenses of 728,000 and deficit of 643. Our housing department, we have uh, funding for 2.6 million with an expense of 2.4. And a deficit of 208,000. Next slide. Our um, health and social facilities. It is we have uh, funding funds for 1.9 million and expenses for 2.1 million with a surplus deficit of 163,000. Our roads is uh, funds for 170,000 and expenses of 1.1 million with a deficit of 940,000. Next slide. Finally, our water, wastewater. We have funds allocated for 1.9 million, expenses of 1.8 with a surplus of 155,000. So in total, for DAHE funding is total is 12.8 million. The expenses is 14.9 million with a surplus deficit of 2.1 million. Great. And Thank you uh, very much, it. Leslie, okay. for the overview of that. And okay. Thank you, everyone. As well. We'll go on to the next program, which is the Economic Development uh, Department. We'll turn to Kylie Tarbell for that. Thank you, Grand Chief. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Kylie Tarbell. I am the Director of Economic Development, and I will be providing you with uh, an update regarding our upcoming activities for this fiscal year. Next slide, please. So Economic Development is comprised of the Economic Development Core Administration, and under the department includes the Enola Go Arena, the Peachtree Mall, Thompson Island Culture Camp, as well as our tobacco and cannabis compliance program. So within the department, we currently have for 15 employees and working with DCSS, uh, we are potentially expanding our programming to add additional employees. And we also mentor on average 10 summer students every year. Next slide, please. So our service area, so economic development core administration. So we're currently uh, throughout COVID, we did change the structure of our department. We were previously the department of Dejo de uh, but you know, due to COVID and certain programs being reallocated under other departments, one core area that we're looking at is the actual structure of the department, which does also include the development of an active corporation. Our main priorities is focusing on Aquazos Lono and capacity development. So if that's training, certification, workshops, you know, we partner with Access quite frequently to support Aquazos Lono uh, training needs. We also provide a small business grant. So that is for startup, for uh, small capital purchases, marketing, advertising, uh, just to support our entrepreneurs and you know, helping them uh, you know, move forward and progress and expand their business. So COVID-19 has taught us that we have to adapt to technology. 
So that is a key priority for us is adapting to technological uh, programming and community engagement, such as what we're doing now via Zoom. We also administer the uh, Quebec AIF, which is the Aboriginal Infrastructure Fund. And this year does mark uh, a new agreement. So we currently are in conversations with Quebec uh, leadership and the province of entering into a new uh, five-year political agreement. So the AIF is our large matching 50-50 grant for our entrepreneurs to support capacity, or I'm sorry, capital, uh, capital improvements and capital purchases. We also uh, oversee the administration of the Peachtree Mall, working with tenants and contracting. The Anolago Arena is currently open for the lacrosse season. Our main priority is focusing on the maintenance and facility upgrades. The arena is an aging facility. So it is a priority for us to modernize as well as do grounds improvements. With COVID-19, with the facility being closed uh, to uh, adhere to COVID guidelines and public safety, we really want to focus on the outside aspect of the ground to support additional activities in the event the facility does have to close again. The arena does operate with a continued deficit. So as uh, last year um, and years prior, we do focus on reducing that deficit. So again, as I mentioned uh, with COVID-19, improved telecommunications has been a priority for us. So with our fiber to the home project, I would like to happily announce we have finally received all of our contribution agreements to proceed with the full implementation. Mohawk Council provided bridge financing to uh, my department regarding sub financial support to start the project in January of 2021. So uh, with good news with our CAs, we will be getting reimbursed those funds. Um, so for those in the district of Gisnaina, we are back in your neighborhood doing connections to the homes. And the last count I had, we were just under 100 homes are connected. So that is a priority for us. Uh, we also partnered with Access and we trained Aquazas Lono to ensure Mohawk workforce. We are currently at a 100% Mohawk content, our workforce for the project. We are also uh, working with Rogers in regards to a new proposed cell, cell phone tower in G Snyna. We did undergo uh, community engagement and consultation for the, the new cell phone tower. Thompson Island Culture Camp. So we currently do not receive core funding. We do rely on OLG funding to support uh, Thompson Island. Uh, again, the camp is open and we are currently scheduling um, camps and trainings uh, for community as well as in the immediate surrounding area. We continuously apply for grants to cover core operations. Uh, the water taxi, so we did receive a grant from Jordan's principal and we are currently almost there with the water taxi. We are just on the final step. We're just waiting for our marine certification to be fully licensed by Transport Canada. We are currently on the island uh, doing routine maintenance due to inclement weather from uh, the winter season. Our tobacco and cannabis program. So we began that program in 2019 and our core responsibility is um, accepting the applications, reviewing the applications, doing the licensing process as well as social responsibility fee. The compliance, so as Sean DeLude uh, mentioned, he also has a compliance uh, division under AMS. So the compliance under ACTEV is strictly administrative, whereas Sean is enforcement. So we do work closely with AMS in regards to um, enforcement and compliance for um, uh, public safety in regards to cannabis. So we do ensure uh, 
uh, all of the licensees um, are adhering to their licensing agreement through uh, routine check-ins and monitoring and uh, communication. We currently have 12 licensed cannabis retailers and three licensed cannabis cultivators. Next slide, please. So just to give you an overview of our um, approved budget for this fiscal year, as you can see, the arena does operate as a deficit. We are continuously looking to generate revenue. So economic development um, core, so that is the administration, cannabis, peace tree, uh, Stanley Island is just a wash. We do have a maintenance cabin on there and you know we have to do some research and some engagement regarding uh, next steps for the maintenance cabin. The Akwazasni Economic Development Fund, which is also referred to as the Aboriginal Initiative Fund through Quebec. So that is also um, a wash uh, because we are just the administrators. What comes in is what goes out to the entrepreneurs. Uh, same with tobacco, we generate minimal revenue uh, due to COVID-19 um, and guidelines and restrictions. We did halt, you know, tobacco sales. So we're just starting to uh, re-engage uh, our tobacco sales. And Thompson Island does uh, operate as a deficit and fiber to the home. So what is coming in is what is being expended. There are no expenses to council. So economic development operates at a $15.3 million funding. We have 15.4 million in expenses with a deficit of roughly 78,000, but we're always applying for grants and uh, we're confident that we will mediate that and we will not have a deficit by the end of the fiscal year. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Kylie uh, Garbao, for that uh, overview and presentation uh, in, for your department. Uh, there is a slide here, if we could just go to the next one really quickly, uh, that has some contact information on it. But <clears throat> as we said, we would take questions, or as I was told, we'll take questions at the end of the uh, presentation here. So uh, are there any questions? I know some have gone into chat this evening, uh, but we have a uh, number of the directors have uh, answered them. But what we will do is extract the ones that have been put in the chat here, and we'll put them as part of the action items for next uh, general meeting uh, for those ones that weren't answered by some of the directors. So. Are there any questions from anybody on the uh, in the room here this evening for what has on what has been presented? Yes, we'll go over here. I, I'm. I so the question those of you that are online um, probably didn't hear it. There was a question about the three cadets coming in. Is the question was whether or not they are. Uh, non-Indigenous or Indigenous persons. So Sean, if you're there, are you able to have, add some information on this or these individuals are not onboarded yet? No, all three individuals are from our community, they're Aquas Aslono. Okay, thank you. Mm. So part of the planning of the, the police services is that uh, there will be succession planning that the executive director will be moving through uh, uh, over the next couple of years. So there's no definite at this point. Is that it? For your questions on the budget? Oh, I'd just like to say one more thing. Well, everything that's going on here, like it's still a meeting in on where all the money is going. Uh, we're doing an awesome job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. So those are there online, probably didn't hear it and they won't uh, uh, be exactly as she said, but she did express appreciation to the work that we're doing here in uh, presenting to the community, letting them know where the money uh, is being spent on behalf of the community and, and the Mohawk Council. So thank you for that. I will say... <laughs> she's uh, she's uh, relayed her AKA name. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will say that uh, we're talking about reporting. One of the other presentations that we need to do, which we will do, 
is the audit presentation as well. So the budget is uh, how we're going to be spending money going forward. The audit is, a, is how we have to spend money going backwards, like after, after it's been done. So that will be done, that presentation will be done uh, in the next coming, coming months. So back to you, yes? I have some more questions, but I We'll just give it a few more minutes. <laughs> if, is there any questions over here about the budget that's been presented? No, okay. All right, um, so we'll ask you to take the, oh, the share screen is down. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all of the directors uh, who are online this evening. I know that it's been uh, very long, but we appreciate all of the presentation this evening and all the work that you're doing on behalf of the Mohawk Council. So thanks for joining us to the directors uh, and the program managers who are, sorry, the associate directors who are on. Much appreciated on behalf of myself and council. Okay, um, so, we will go to questions from the floor. Um, we have about probably about 15, 20 minutes on that. Uh, so we'll turn it over to you. So I don't, I'm not aware that the question is, or that the offer is still there. I know that at the time, which is probably about uh, four years ago now at this time, there was a uh, ask for assistance to start one and we have provided support as much as we can, but it was not the Mohawk Council uh, going to run a detox center. It was going to be the, the, the organization that was coming to us wanted to run the detox center. What I can say, though, is that our Department of Health right now is in uh, conversations with uh, Cornell Community Hospital to start a detox here in the community. So we are looking at expanding that service with our partners at the hospital. Well, he has a building on his uh, mm -hmm. so Yeah, well, I don't, I mean, we're talking a couple, yeah, we're talking a couple years. I'm not sure that the offer to use or partner is still there, but understanding that when we go into facilities, especially around medical uh, services, we have to renovate and you know, it has to meet certain standards and codes in buildings. So that's one of the things that we're challenged by when we expand services. Well, if the building is up to code, it's not explained up to Yeah, again, I don't know if the software is still well, current. Maybe you should check into it, maybe that would be a good idea. We can reach out. Our facility is open here on the yeah. Yeah. So I again, the uh, the uh, health department is working with Cornwall Community Hospital to bring detox beds to up the Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay. I um, we will go to other questions um, from the floor or um, on the Zoom. Thanks, Melissa. Or what the other name you used? Anastasia. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I didn't report earlier at the beginning of the meeting the uh, action items from the last general meeting. So I will read those for the record. My apologies. Um, we uh, went a little off script on that. So one of the questions was: uh, Do we still have a housing law? If not, is it going to be added in with this new agreement? This is in reference to bylaw 1260 being rescinded by MCA's lawyers with no consultation input from the community. So the regulations uh, for the Indian Reserve Housing Loan, BCR 1360, was removed from the Upper Registry on November 23rd, 2020 by MCR 2020-21. Currently, there is no housing bylaw, but the MCA housing loans and the administration of MCA rentals are governed by MCA housing department policies, procedures, as well as the Upper Sustainable Financial Administration Law. The other question was, could council report the amounts of interest the Dundee settlement has gained thus far? This will have to do with, and this will have to do with roads. So 
As per finance, there's currently 2.1 million in interest. The discussion is ongoing with the current needs to address the roads issue and several areas of funding have been, have been applied for currently. So I know that specifically around the Wade LaFrance roads, uh, that this road continues to be a priority uh, for the community. We do uh, receive regular calls about the condition. I can tell you, and as, has, as the director of uh, DIHE has explained before, we've brought on some uh, a new program manager who is helping manage the situation. We have reported previously that they are a bit short staffed there. They're doing the best that they can. Uh, we do, we are lobbying hard the government of Canada for resources to uh, finish Wade LaFrance. We've put some in, we have made some investments there already. So investments on River Road. Uh, this is our, our priority to, uh, to move this project forward. So your, uh, your, your demands uh, for uh, road constructions is, is not going unheard and we are working on that. So that is, that's it for the uh, two follow-up items that I had that I, pre I had it recorded uh, earlier on. I will ask if there's anything else that uh, anybody here this evening wanted to address with council. Okay. If not, I'm going to move to uh, read the resolution. Oops, sorry, I do see a hand online. Uh, Vincent, that will go to you. Grand Chief? Yeah, I can hear you, go ahead. Okay, um, there were some things uh, that I had written in the chat that weren't really answered or not answered to my satisfaction. Um, and I, I thought we were going to have time to discuss it afterwards. That's why I, I started writing it while the, while the uh, presentations were going on. One of them is the, uh, like in the SNI district, We've been asking for questions about the SNI um, uh, substation, police substation, and uh, and how it's been described as an operating substation. And uh, we've had several community members saying that it is really, it, it it's not really a substation. What is going on with that? Thank you. Uh, Sean, I don't know if you're still on, if you can address that. Yes, I'm here. Uh, that's not a station that's manned 24-7. It's a station where the officers will stop while they're in patrols in SNI to either write reports or if somebody want, does not want to come to the station and not want to be met at their home to file a, a complaint, they could be met there. That, okay. That is Okay, we were told by one of the SNI district chiefs that that was man 24 seven. No. Anyway, um, the other, the other, the other information, the other piece of uh, the questions that we've also had in SNI is, and I think at the general meetings as well, is the question about like, who who decided and who like was there consultation to the community about the police station moving to Cornwall Island? I'll divert this question to Grand Chief. Do you want to take it? Yeah, I can speak to that. So um, the decision has not been made at this time to move the uh, the central location of the Oxfam Police Service. We are currently in uh, conversations in design uh, with a, a private uh, owner who uh, we are moving towards uh, costing out what it would cost to be able to rent long term a uh, facility that could be used for a police service. Now, our, our experience around uh, some of the um, you know, recent incidents of a couple of years ago has identified some of the gaps with, with respect to the current facility that's being used here in Ganadigo, as well as we continue to, to expand um, the community footprint, we continue to require you know, more, more police officers, which means that we need more space. And the, the police station here in Ganadigo uh, is not adequate and, and there's not any space to expand. In fact, there's not much space to expand anything in here in Ganadigo. So 
part of the you know the vision is that we would relocate the main office of, of uh, the Upper one Police Service to Cornell Island, and then this the station here would then become a, a substation as well. Now, no decisions have been made on this, uh, but that is what you know part of the planning is that's happening. Are you still there, Vincent? I'm having tr trouble hearing you. Yeah, I think you may have a bad connection because you're coming in skipping. Yeah, I'm in and out, so uh, you keep going. Hello? No. Hello? Yeah, no. The other thing that's important to know, right, is that regardless of where the administration is happening of the police services, if the expectations is that the police will be on the road, right? So it's not, they're not sitting in offices. Uh, in order to keep the community safe, they need to be on the road. So wherever the, you know, the administration is, is one spot, but, you know, the police aren't expected to be in that place at all times. So I know that there's some reservations about moving the police uh, station to Cornell Island. I would expect, and I think I, and this would be expectation of council, is that the service level would not change from any district to the other, regardless of where the administration is happening for the police services. Well, I, I wish the service level would increase in every district, no, no matter where, where the police state or where the admin is. Um, but there is, an, there is an issue that we, as our community grow, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, as our community grows, as you said, and, uh, and like we, we get, we, we just, Abram, we need a, a, a police station in each of the three districts where the, where there will be police, uh, there will be police um, patrolling in each of the three districts, all 24-7. Uh, you know, I think the, the time that it takes for somebody uh, if from any of the districts to get to any of the districts can be the difference between life or death for some situations and uh and if the, if the council can work toward making that happen uh i think that would be the the best thing for public security all all the way around yeah no absolutely we acknowledge that and, and we have been through uh you know the last couple of years expanding the police service through the presentation you may have seen that the, the water service is now moving towards 24 7 which means an expansion of service now we wouldn't be doing that if it takes officers off the road which means we're putting more boots on the ground to protect the community but we acknowledge what you're saying and this is a priority of ours as well as we expand as we expand the community and base the other thing service. too is that okay the other thing too is that i i i have to applaud um people's efforts in doing this community watch program and uh, I've said it at other meetings. Uh, is where is it, and are we are we moving along to getting again like what you you said, boots on the ground, or or people organized to be able to help the community, help help the the police. Yeah. So the the portfolio has been working with uh, members of the police service to make sure that we're moving this along. Um, I don't have an exact update of where it is right now, but we can work towards getting a written update for the next meeting. Yeah, I think rest, that's rest a... Assured, rest assured, Constable Norman King has been spearheading this for AMPS, and he's been in contact with different community members uh, in regards to the Community Watch Program. Thank okay. you for that. Thank okay. you. I'm going to... Vincent, I do have another hand up, so I'm going to go to them at this time. Okay. Vanessa Howie, I, I see you have your hand up, we'll go to you. Yes, good evening. Uh, you may or may not be able to answer this question now, although I've asked it in district meetings several times. We're still within tax season, and I guess this relates to uh, Quebec, to um, Quebec residents and the health fund, the tax abasement abatement discussions that were held several years ago. I wonder if you can tell me the outcome. You'll have to give me a bit more detail on, on, on what the situation is, sorry. In filing um, taxes for Quebec residents, 
after the taxes have been calculated, there's an additional sum, well over $500 that's, that's added to my bill, to my taxes. And I recall, um, it may be five to seven years ago, there was some discussion between MCA and I don't know whether it was Revenue Quebec or the Regie, you know, um, Health and Social Services, but it was regarding that, that tax. Now, they were abatement discussions. Now, abatement would, would mean that we would be exempt from those taxes. And I'm wondering what the outcome was. Yeah, I do recall that there was some conversation on a health tax that was being levied. I, do, I don't think that's happening yes. anymore. Um, is that the uh, one you're referring to? Yes. And every year I end up having to pay it. And okay. if I don't have to pay it, I'd like to know so that I can eliminate it. Yeah, so if you could reach out uh, to my office or myself, and what we'll do is we'll we want to see a, a, some in, additional information on that. And mm -hmm. what we can do is refer to our auditor who helps with our uh, tax questions in situations like this. Great. So you, okay, you, we'll you do. Shoot me an email and we'll, uh, we'll get some answers uh, to find out if this is why this is being applied and if there's something we can do about it. Okay, thank you. All right, now. Are there any no. other questions from anybody in the room? Yeah, go ahead and we'll go to you. <laughs> you can go ahead. I'll, I'll just uh, I'll recap your question after you ask it for those who can't hear. Yeah, so <clears throat> I, I want to thank you. Uh, the question, just uh, those who are online, is um, why is it uh, you're not able to sell alcohol in the community and uh, in comparison to some of the cannabis establishments that are here in the community? Um, so I want to thank you. I know that you had recently writ written us and we have brought that forward to council for uh, consideration. We do have a draft, we do have a response to you. Um, but what I can say is that um, the difference in cannabis and alcohol is that in around, you know, the mid-1985, around there, mid-80s, uh, there was a referendum done in the community that uh, resulted in, in the prohibition of selling of alcohol. In fact, it also says the possession of alcohol in the community. Um, so at this time, the law continues to exist. And what, you know, the, the reference that you're talking about in changing laws or amending laws is really the process that needs to be used to be able to move towards that. Council, in this case of this law, because it went to a referendum at the time, uh, will require a vote of the community uh, to remove that law or change that law. Now, with cannabis, um, there's, there was no, no cannabis law in place. Council will put in an interim regulation that uh, regulates the, the activities of cannabis. So the comparison is a little bit different because alcohol... Uh, you know, has been regulated in, in Canada broadly for a very long time. I know that this is not, you know, ideal answer. <clears throat> we have, uh, in my experience in being here, received this question, you know, at various points in time, generally from business people that want to be able to, you know, add this service to their, to their community business or uh, people that want to do functions in the community and be able to you know, sell alcohol for a wedding or a reception or what have you. And unfortunately, because of the law continues to exist, we're not able to. So what it will require is the uh, up assessment review, uh, sorry, a legislative overview commission to say, we want to examine and change the law on sale of alcohol, and then they'll move towards uh, getting that done. 
So I would say that, you know, if there are other business persons interested in various laws that they don't agree with, they need to express their opinion through that um, survey process or put it in writing or call the, uh, the, the coordinator uh, that works on that. And, you know, they'll begin the process. Unfortunately, council in this case can't direct that it has to be done. No, I, I completely understand that, uh, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't help, and especially our location. I mean, in some locations, you can have one selling across the road from one that can't. I mean, uh, that's just how our jurisdiction works. And it's not, uh, you know, it's not always uh, conducive to economic development, but I encourage you to, to uh, reach out uh, through the process there uh, and um, express that. And if there are other business persons that are interested, you know, that's how things this, in this case, you know, will hopefully see a change at some point. Now, acknowledging that the sale of alcohol in our community at the time was very controversial as well. You know, there was a lot of hurt, there was a lot of uh, abuse, you know, as a result of it. So this is not, you know, uh, something that's going to be taken lightly by the community, by council, um, but, you know, it's also not something that's impossible as well. That's why there's, you know, the need for regulations, the need for oversight um, in, in areas like this. Okay. We will be sending a letter back to you as well, but we're, all, we're able to talk offline if you'd like as well. Is there anything else on the floor? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So the the law, the question that's being asked on the floor is about the drug law that exists and why do we have a cannabis law and how those kind of interrelate. So the uh, the drug ban it's a drug banishment law though. So it talks about if persons have uh, you know have been in possession of uh, controlled substance uh, and are charged and there's a process under it. When Canada legalized cannabis, they took cannabis out of that prohibition. That law relies on what is prohibited, right? And that's a certain drugs. When Canada legalized it, it then came out of what is referenced in the banishment law. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, yeah, so, well, the, the drug banishment law speaks to, again, uh, if people are caught with it, the cannabis law, cannabis regulation speak oh, is about. Yeah, but the, the, the drug banishment law only speaks to, it's more of a, uh, it's not a regulatory law. Doesn't say. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's it's um, the way it's been designed at this time is that there's a cannabis regulation. We're moving towards a full cannabis law, and the drug banishment law continues to remain a standalone. Okay, uh, Vincent, uh, I see you have a question, and then we're going to move to uh, close the meeting. Go ahead, okay. Vincent. Um, how did this like? <clears throat> we're not quite at a law for cannabis. How do we get rid of, how did it come into place? Why are we doing, why are we selling cannabis? And uh, I, uh, you know, it's, it's for people to make money and stuff, but I think we've got enough issues related to drug addictions and, and uh, uh, behaviors that are caused by drugs. Like my understanding is this came in as a result of a survey that I'm not sure if it was ECDEV that did, um, but I don't think it was a referendum. Am I wrong? Uh, no, it was not a referendum. Um, so uh, 
when Canada started talking about regulating or legalizing cannabis, uh, the, the committee or, or economic developer council, I can't recall at the time, uh, was, was proactive in this area. And what they done is they started going to the community to ask what their thoughts were around cannabis and if this is a regulatory system that we should put in place. And as a result, um, council moved towards uh, implementing a regulatory system around it. Now, understanding that it was either um, regulated or fight with prob probably fight with unregulated activities happening around it. And council chose that they would go to uh, regulating it rather than have a total ban or the provinces issuing licenses in the community and then fighting over jurisdiction around it. That's kind of in a nutshell uh, how that came about. But um, where we're moving towards now is implementing uh, the cannabis law and the community through the law enactment or through the legislative process has the ability to put input into what that regulation system looks like. So, so we could still in fact take that, the distribution, selling, possession out of our community if, if we so desire. And, and, and am I not right that almost all, many things that we have uh, in this community, councils, your council and previous councils had have had to argue with other jurisdictions that we are taking, we are, we are going to recognize what we want in this community, including the membership code. You know, it's not, yes, there are other things out there there's the Indian Act out there and everything that would take care, let's say, take care of that issue, membership issue. But we as a community decided no, and we fought that, that, that they get out of that jurisdiction. And, and so that's some, if this, isn't, this isn't a given that we have to do this, is it? No, it's not, and uh, the community can have an input into how that law is shaped, and if there are certain activities under cannabis that they don't want to see, yes. then they can, they can put input into it. But, you know, I mean, our approach has been, you know, what is reasonable and what's not and what's conducive to, you know, the community's desire. Ultimately, if the community at the end of the day doesn't want it, then it can move towards prohibition. But if the community wants a regulatory system that supports safe, has an economic engine to it, but also has a benefit to the community through contributions, then that's, that they'll, they'll be as well. So, so how much is contributed by these, these, uh, these 12, uh, dispensary, uh, 12 dispensaries and three manufacturers? Like how much is, how much is Aquizasna getting out of those? 15 or um uh companies yeah so i don't have the data right off hand but what we can do is we can uh, provide Grand that. Chief, I, i'm still on the call i can assist if you'd like um, <laughs> um hi Vincent, this is kylie from active um mm -hmm. so just to give you an overview, so between the application fees we've collected and the social responsibility fee, we are currently sitting at 190,000 surplus. So that is uh, just being held. It has not been distributed or anything. It is just uh, in holding with Mohawk Council. So that's not part of the, so that's not part of the budget we just received? Uh, correct. So, well, sort of. So in the budget that we have disclosed uh, currently, um, yes. Yeah. So basically, I do not have a compliance officer, my administrative, so myself and Ali Oaks McCumber. Uh, we've just been administering cannabis. So there's there's currently been minimal deficit regarding uh, the, the cannabis. So it's been, you know, strictly revenue and we're just holding that pot of money until um, community um, identifies or council identifies uh, a need. Okay. okay. And and do you know like, can you has there been any kind of analysis about what kind of monies we're putting into having people recover from addictions and and stuff like that? Um, that there, would be that would be under the Department of Health, Vincent. No, but I'm just, this is a council meeting. Uh, yeah. You might not know the answer, but 
it's a question from a community member to the yeah. council. Oh yeah, no, totally understand. I just unfortunately don't have that uh, answer for you, Vincent. Uh, maybe health uh, or that could be something we can get back to you on. Well, I'm not asking for economic development to get back to me on that. I'm asking Thank for you. the council to find that information. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much to both of you. Uh, thank you, Kylie, for the intervention. Um, make what we'll do is, uh, I could say that, you know, some of the, com the conversation that we've been having around cannabis also is around harm reduction. And this is something that council will continue to move forward on in ensuring that there's a balance in the approach uh, around the regulatory system of cannabis, but make sure that we're making investments into harm reduction as well. Yes, I can echo that, Grand Chief. We are uh, making that a priority this year. And Vincent, I can follow up with you on your question if you'd like to um, connect after the meeting. All right, thank you very much to both of you. I, uh, at this time, I'm going to move towards uh, bringing the meeting to close. So I do want to thank everybody for joining us this evening. I want to thank all of the uh, senior executives team here at the Mohawk Council and all our support staff for everything uh, this evening uh, on the MCA operating budget. There was a question of whether or not to receive copies. We will make sure uh, that all the people that have emailed in get a copy of this budget presentation. We'll make sure that it's available on our, on our, um, our website as well. And then again, this uh, meeting is being recorded uh, and will be available on YouTube our uh, social media pages as well for, for viewing uh, for um, later on. So I'm going to read a re uh, resolution into the minutes for um, the record to accept and approve the attached general meeting minutes dated March 24th, 2022. Could I have a mover please? Moved by Vanessa, second by Joanne. Discussion on the resolution. Question. Question. question has been called on resolution. All in favor? Any against? None against. It's carried. So, all right, ladies and gentlemen, that brings the close to our uh, general meeting this evening of April 28th. Our next general meeting will take place on May 26th. It will be held at the Deshina Recreation Center as well as an online uh, in the hybrid fashion. So, Thank you all to all of you, and I hope all of you have a great evening. Could I have a motion to adjourn? Moved by Ryan, second by Tim. All in favor? All right, thank you very much to all of you. Have a great evening.